welcome to Ticket to the Cup, our journey to the FIFA Women's World Cup. I'm Tracy Holmes. Today we'll hear from Matilda Steph Catley, also FIFA's head of women's sports, Sarai Barryman, and we'll take you from a World War I factory through to the pinnacle of the women's game today. First though, here's what's making news. The provisional Matilda squad has been named ahead of the group gathering for a high performance camp on the Gold Coast. It includes veteran Kaya Simon, the only First Nations player to have been capped more than 100 times. She'll be given the chance to prove her fitness to play in her third World Cup. Yeah! Defending champions USA will be without captain Becky Saubrun due to a foot injury, announcing on Twitter, heartbroken isn't even the half of it. While the FIFA World Cup continues its red carpet tour around Australia and New Zealand, all 32 nations competing are making their final preparations before arriving down under. Eight nations will be making their World Cup debut in 2023. They are Haiti, Morocco, Panama, Philippines, Portugal, Republic of Ireland, Vietnam and Zambia. And FIFA has confirmed a social media tool protecting players from online abuse will be made available to all teams after a successful trial at the Men's World Cup in Qatar. The social media protection service developed by FIFA and the players association FIFPro monitors hate speech and hides harmful content. Over 20 million posts were scanned during Qatar's World Cup with 20,000 found to be abusive, discriminatory or threatening. It was one of the darkest days in football history. In 2015, police raided a Swiss hotel, arresting dozens of football officials from around the world. In the end, hundreds of millions of dollars were returned from scams. Lots were charged, several were jailed. But it led to sweeping reforms at FIFA HQ, including for the first time, the appointment of a head of women's football, Sarai Barryman. As many people know, and, and some may not, as you mentioned, there was a very dark moment for FIFA in 2015, uh, which led to the arrests of some of the top executives, uh, basically for corruption. And although that was a difficult time for football, uh, it presented this incredible opportunity for women's football. And basically as part of this reform process that took place, it was recognised as the number one priority and the biggest growth opportunity to football and to our sport today. And that was a very, very clear message from the Reform Committee to the organisation that the position of woman in decision-making roles within football, from the top all the way down to the bottom, needed to be more. How responsible does FIFA feel for driving those sorts of changes or is it enough for FIFA to provide the platform where change can be brought about because of things like what we're seeing in Saudi Arabia mm. with regard to women mm. or the changes that we saw happen in Qatar with regard to workers' rights? Yeah. How much can you do? Yeah. How big is your remit? <laughs> How well, many that's, days that's are there in yeah, your week? Yeah, exactly. How many hours are there in a day? You know what? It's a combination of both. We have the platform. We have the most popular sport in the world. Literally millions and millions of women, girls, men and boys are playing our sport. So we have an obligation to use that platform as a way to better society. So there's that. But we also should be driving change. And Iran is a perfect example where we were able to use that platform to actually drive change and have women attending for the first time ever football matches in stadiums. I often think people believe our remit is much more <laughs> than what we can do. After all, we are only a sport, but we do not underestimate the power we have being the most popular sport in the world. And like I said, that's something that's really powerful and unique, and we don't take that lightly. When uh, the 2023 FIFA Women's World Cup is all done, mm -hmm. what do you hope will be the legacy, both here in Australia and in New Zealand? Well, first of all, there should be, I, I want to see it be the number one participation sport in this country. And what struck me about Australia, which I didn't realise until they were awarded the hosting of this event, 
is how competitive the sporting environment here is. It's absolutely crazy. I'd love to see it be the number one participation sport for females here uh, in this country. And not only in terms of participation on the field, and fans, fans as well. You know, um, we were fortunate enough to be here when the A-League, the women's uh, A-League uh, final, you know, it was incredible to see a record crowd there, amazing, but I'd love to see that stadium full. And I think that will happen after this Women's World Cup. And the same in New Zealand, you know, we're always competing with rugby there. There's a much bigger lift to do in New Zealand um, in terms of growing the popularity of the sport. Um, here in Australia, the Matildas are massive. Everyone wants to be Sam Kerr. Um, the team is everywhere. In New Zealand, we don't quite have that with the football firms. There's some incredible athletes playing for some of the best teams in the world, but they're just not as known. Beyond New Zealand and Australia, the Pacific region for me is obviously very dear, uh, having spent so many years in Samoa. Um, and the wider Asia region as well. Um, we've just got to break down those barriers and make sure that every opportunity that a young boy has through football is also there for every young girl. Sarai Barryman, thank you so much. Thank you. Matilda number 177 is Steph Catley, a feature of the women's national team for more than a decade. Her club career has taken her from Melbourne, across the USA, and now to Arsenal in the Women's Super League. The 2023 FIFA World Cup will be Steph's third. When I think about the World Cup and, you know, how much promotion's going into it, um, how big it's going to be for us as a team, I think after the World Cup, I hope that women's football, women's sport is at the forefront of everything sort of in Australia. And girls can look at us and say, I want to be like them. I want to be a female footballer and know that it's a legitimate career pathway and it's something they can absolutely do and go after it. And do you get the sense that we're, we're almost there? There's so much more talk now about whether it's our cricket team or our basketball team or our netball team. Uh, and we've got the leagues happening as well in AFLW and NRLW. And, and do you get the sense that the celebration of what the Matildas are is something that is, it's, it's up there. You can mention to anyone in Australia Matildas, they know who you are. I think us as the Matildas, I think Australia has really taken to us and has really um, fallen in love with us as a team. But in terms of women's sport in general in Australia, I still think it has a long, long way to go. The equality there is just really not even close um, it's a lot further along over here in the UK in terms of football and women's football. Um, and I hope that can happen. Hopefully after the World Cup in Australia, things like the W League can sort of start to come up closer to, you know, equal with the men. Can you explain what the difference is? So people here might not um, fully grasp what it's like where you are and what some of the other European leagues are like and the American League. The England team won the Euros at home this year. And I mean, already I would say that the WSL was quite far ahead in terms of professionalism, um, standards, medical standards, um, you know, equipment, um, the facilities, everything like that is, is fantastic over here. But I think the girls winning the Euros on home soil for the league did so much and put us in a position that just... Um, I think it attracted a brand new set of people to the women's game. And from there, you know, we've seen crowd sizes go through the roof. Sometimes it does take something like that, some sort of stimulus to push, you know, the things underneath it along. And I think if you think about, you know, us as Matildas going into this World Cup, um, we're hoping to, you know, do something similar and have that sort of chain reaction to the, the rest for the W League and, and grassroots football and things like that. So that's something that um, we would, you know, love to achieve. How, how do you prepare for something like a World Cup at home? Having not played one at home, is it possible to prepare for what you're going to experience? I honestly don't think it is possible. Um, I've played in two World Cups now and those were even pretty impossible to prepare for. The first one was my first World Cup. The second one, you're more experienced, but then you get there and you're like, 
no, you, you can't really prepare for it. Um, but a home world cup's like a completely different kettle of fish. You know, it's a dream come true for any athlete, for a footballer. It's just, it's everything. Um, it's something you think you'll never get in your lifetime. Um, you don't even think about it as a dream because it's just, you wouldn't expect it to happen. So um, in terms of preparation, I'm just going day by day, trying to stay healthy, getting as fit as possible, focusing on, you know, the opponents. We know we're going to be, we're going to be playing. And then, you know, as it comes closer, I'm sure I'll just be excited and ready to get out there. I honestly wish it was tomorrow because I just want to, I just want to get started. <laughs> like, I'm just so excited, but to play in front of family and friends for my country at a World Cup in Australia, it's just honestly, can't even put it into words. It's just the best thing ever. Women have been playing football in Australia for more than a century. It's been a rocky road full of determination and resilience. And now Australia and New Zealand are hosting the biggest women's sporting event ever. It's also the third biggest sporting event in the world behind the Olympics and the FIFA Men's World Cup. Eleni Soltis takes us back to where it all began. The First World War had some unintended consequences. With the men off fighting, women went to work strengthening their case for the right to vote. They also took up sport. Factories fielded football teams, one of the best known from Preston. The reputation of these tough Lancashire women even reached Australia. A Queensland journalist who went by the name Right Half wrote about a match between the Lancashire women and a team from France. The journalist observed that although they were a heavier combination than the French women, they lost. He went on to say... The French team was drawn from the magasin and offices of Paris. Long, thin girls, short, nuggety girls, big, lumpy girls, and dainty, shapely girls. Surely, in face of this, no one can deny that the material for women's soccer teams is available in Brisbane. It was 1921, and women's football was just beginning to take shape here in Australia. The formation of the Queensland Ladies Soccer Football Association angered Queensland Football Association boss Mr J.W. Kendall. The women were so angry they turned to the Australian Rules League for the inaugural match as a curtain raiser to that code's game. It's believed to be Australia's first public game of women's association football. The crowd, 10,000 strong. A series of matches followed, but then came December 5, 1921, a dark day for women's football. A cable from London declared the Council of the Football Association had prohibited the use of its grounds by women, expressing a strong opinion that the game is quite unsuitable for women. In February 1922, the British Association Interstate Conference in Melbourne decided to also ban women. So, did the ban work? No, not really. The women were defiant and discreet. The Queensland Ladies Football Association kept their games and whereabouts a secret. But in the following decades, the ban affected the resources and the grounds available to them. In 1971, there was a qualifying match between France and the Netherlands for a Women's World Cup in Mexico. Many years later, FIFA would officially recognise this game, but not the tournament. 1971 was also the year the Football Association in England lifted its ban on women. Seven years later, a girl called Theresa Bennett legally challenged the FA for a right to play in an under-12s boys team. I was crying. I've always loved football and I always will. Theresa Bennett won her case, attracting headlines around the world. But six weeks later, the FA successfully appealed. Theresa and her parents weren't even told about the court date till 5.30 that very morning. Such as women's football, one step forward, two steps back. But if there's one thing to learn about the women's game, it's this. Defiance and persistence pays off. Thanks to your company on Ticket to the Cup, you can catch our interviews in full and more on iView and online. And also don't forget to check out our weekly podcast. See you next week on Ticket to the Cup.